So, uh, thanks for the introduction, and I'm really excited to talk in about uh, our research about uh, detecting independent and recurrent copy number here. And first of all, uh, we know that cancer is driven largely by somatic mutation that accumulate uh, in the genome over an individual lifetime. And this somatic mutation can range in scale from the single nucleotide variation or a larger copy number variation or uh, and uh, a large genome rearrangement of course structural variation. And recently, uh, advance uh, in sequencing technology make us possible to uh, characterize this somatic mutation possible. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on only one type of uh, variation. It's the uh, copy number variation. Yeah. So um, uh, just to make sure everybody is on the same page, uh, I will make some background introduction for the technology to detect the DNA copy number. Uh, so in past decades, several approach uh, has been introduced to measure the copy number variation. And um, the SNP array, for example, here, and the next generation sequencing data, um, we and are uh, largely used uh, in the recent study because they can perform the better uh, resolution here. And uh, the, for example, the SNP array, you can measure the copy number change across all the uh, markers on the genome, or you can uh, use next generation sequencing data to map the, uh, to measure the copy number, which is uh, you can align uh, the read on the reference and then measure the copy number distribution based on the read depth. So based on this copy number distribution, the segmentation process then can turn this distribution uh, into uh, the interval with uh, the, the corresponding copy number and also the boundary um, of this copy number. And this um, segmentation process, there are so many works that have been introduced. For example, like CBS, GLAD, PanCMV can be used in a SNP array data, or like BigSeq can be used in next generation sequencing data. And so we got the operation for a single sample, and we would like to ask a question is that, how do you distinguish the driver somatic copy number operation that are responsible for uh, the cancer progression from the passenger somatic copy number operation that are irrelevant for the cancer phenotype. So more and more samples are sequenced, so we can uh, actually, the, there are several computational approach mention this uh, problem and they all use the same idea. It's that you take multiple samples together and then align them in the genome coordination and try to find the recurrent region that's shared by multiple samples. So like the color, uh, uh, blue rectangle I color here, which is the recurrent region. And to determine uh, which one is the driver, you can have your own approach, like heuristic approach. You can define some frequency and to uh, make sure um, the region is larger than some frequency. For example, like the far right, these two, they are uh, mutated in all the samples, it's probably the driver. But actually, if you look at the structure of the genome, it's quite complicated. It's not just like a single event here, it's sometimes like uh, shifting uh, between the samples. So um, let's take just one type of the copy number operation and across 20 samples here, for example. So each gray bar is a copy number operation, say deletion. And the blank here means there's no copy number operation. And the current approach, um, I think the well-known approach should be a uh, logistic-wise approach. So like just special, like in special, like logistic two has been applied on several TCGA cancer uh, projects to detect the recurrent copy number version. And though based on the recurrent score, and since they are original de uh, decided for the SNP array data, so they measure the score uh, for each the probe locus, and you can get the blue curve like this one. And so the next challenge is that you get the, uh, this high scoring region and how do you determine uh, which score, uh, which, sorry, sorry, which high scoring function, which high scoring region should be the driver one? And they propose an approach, it's a kind of iterative approach. I will mention them briefly in the following slides. So the idea here is that you select a highest score peak, and then um, you remove the interval, or either in the, the lattice approach, G62, they reweight the interval. Then support, for this supporting peak, and then rescore, you get the new score, this curve, uh, without the, uh, the, peak, the interval that's supporting the main peak. And then you can pick the highest score again for this new curve, and do the same things. You remove the intervals between the peak, and then you can get the third curve, it's a green one, here. 
So this approach looks promising because you can get the, uh, three peaks here to treat them as the driver. And however, if you actually put the original, disc, um, original uh, copy number back here, you can see the distribution for the middle one is missing because this is actually the second highest peak if you consider all of them. So um, um, we would say that th there's kind of like um, a limitation that uh, this iterative approach will missing the power to detect the uh, copy number event that uh, nested within uh, several highest peak. Okay. And so the next limitation we observe is from the long tail phenomena. So the long tail phenomena I used an histogram as an example showing here, uh, which means uh, the long tail phenomena is that um, only a few of uh, mutation, uh, only a few of cancer related gene are mutated at high frequency. However, many more uh, cancer related gene, they are actually mutating very low frequency like the uh, right tail at distribution. And because of this reality, it's kind of hard, very hard to distinguish this rare event from the passenger event. And just like previous speakers say that um, the cancer is a, actually cancer is a uh, pathway disease. So uh, recently cancer study, they uh, characterized so many key, uh, key pathways and showing that uh, how, um, how the pathway are perturbed by the somatic mutation. Um, so this reveals the idea that um, we don't need to take we should, we should not take just single gene, we should take like a set of gene to consider uh, whether this is driver or not. So there are several approaches that uh, try to analyze, analyze in the com combination of the mutation together to, to, to help us to detect the rare mutation. And you put the uh, recurrence idea back to here is that the recurrent copy number is somehow like you, have ne you need to have like muted in some certain threshold of frequ frequency which is actually the recurrence of the left part of the, this long tail, of this distribution. And you have got no chance, or not, not no chance, very low chance to get uh, the, the, the uh, driver event that mutates very rare. So um, let's get rid of the recurrence. If we just take all copy number and you do the calling for them, this is probably another good idea. You can uh, detect the rare event, but if you call by best, it's kind of like you will get too many unfocused operation. So you would like the approach is that just in between them, it's like you can uh, identify some recurrent copy number operation. Also, you, can, you have the power to detect the rare one. So just to recall the limitation is that uh, iterative manner, probably not general optimal selection. And we want to focus more on the independent and the rare event. So we propose the algorithm called REC which can simultaneously identify uh, the potential recurrent region in the genome and also capable for uh, identify the uh, rare event and dependent event. And also this approach can be, uh, is adaptable for the high throughput sequencing data and SNP array. And first of all, we, let's talk about how we um, find in the recurrent region. This uh, idea is that we model the copy number as an interval graph so interval grade G here for each vertex, it's an interval in a sample here. And the, uh, ver each edge is uh, mean the overlap between the interval. And so we can model this uh, um, copy number distribution as the graph. And then the recurrent region here is actually the click um, in this graph. And we would like to find a maximal subset of interval with uh, the common intersection. So it's actually the maximal click in this graph. So for a chromosome unit, say like an arm of a chromosome, we create an interval graph and then you enumerate all maximal click in uh, this integral graph, and which can be uh, done in the polynomial term. And we after got the set of uh, clicks from C1 here to C5, and we, have need, we need to design a scoring function to make sure, uh, to understand which one is important. And before we go into the scoring function, let's make some uh, observation here. So first of all is that we, no, we, we observe that some maximal click are formed by erroneous interval. So for example, like C5 here, if this is this short interval, uh, it was deemed to be an experimental error rather than a true copy number. If you remove that, this click will be gone. And also like the C3 here, if this is a wrong definition of the segmentation algorithm, it slightly shifted to the right, 
And if this is not overlapping by any interval in C3, this, 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 this click, C3 click will, will also disappear. So uh, we would like the scoring function that, of course, first, uh, we, we don't need the probe information. And second is that for like, we want the, uh, a pro, uh, the scoring function that can interpret the interval unique to a single click, like C1 here, which is quite unique. There are several unique uh, in the interval inside there. And third one is that uh, we would like to exclude some erroneous interval, just like I mentioned before. Okay, so we, without the probe, probe and marker, we, how do we score in the, the maximal click? So we use the idea called boundary endpoint, which is the grid dot here. And we use the boundary endpoint because this boundary endpoint is defined by the segmentation algorithm, which tell you there's a significance change before or after the boundary endpoint. And you can imagine that if the region or a maximal click is surrounded by several boundary endpoints that tell you there's a significant change in there. So we use this boundary endpoint and to determine the score for a single click CK here, it's we first identify the left boundary endpoint, which means uh, the set of interval that cross CK and whose who's, uh, left, left endpoint uh, it's uh, in front of CK, but after CK minus one. And the green one means the right endpoint is the same idea here. So we take the pair between the left endpoint and right endpoint just to avoid the asymmetric, where the number of left and right uh, are dramatic difference. And also we have an idea as to another scoring is for the consecutive maximal click. So for a block, Mean the block means a conservative click. So block BIJ means the click from CI to CJ. And the idea here is we want to pick a pivot click which dominates this block. And the nearby click, like these two, these two click are formed by the erroneous uh, interval, just for the idea I mentioned before. And if we remove them, these two clicks will go on. And you will get the very uh, dominant one here, and you can do the same scoring for a single click. And since this is like, you want to guarantee to find a best pivot inside the block, so we go through all of them. This is a P at the J minus one. We got a score, and also you can try this one and get the same score, and then find a maximum one as the pivot, okay. So we understand how to score in the uh, our maximal click by either a single one or a multiple one. And the next step is to try to separate them and to, uh, to select an independent and recurrent copy number. So the independent here means we need to partition and group the maximal click into independent one. And optionally, you can check the recurrence for uh, the, uh, the click. So we, the goal is to find a collection of independent and recurrent copy number. And if you turn this problem into our model here, it's actually to find a selection of non-overlapping block. So you can find a selection like this one, with a non-overlapping block, or you can try another selection, is this one. And so which selection is best? So you can enumerate all of them and to try to find the optimal one. And this, the, 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 here we have to define the first is that for a selection, a score is just sum over all score for each block inside your selection. And so we define the problem is that we try to find an optimal selection P star, which is maximized over all such selection. And in, inside this selection, the size of all blocks sh uh, can be, sh should not be too large, or you can set your own, uh, uh, set the size of the, blo the block. And also we filter out some very, very low frequency uh, uh, clicks here by set the cutoff de delta. And delta is also another, has another, uh, a function is that you can avoid the situation called over partitioning. That it's um, several individual clicks uh, with low score and then prevent the, the creation for the large block, okay? So we solve this problem by dynamic programming. I'm not going to go over the whole dynamic programming, but I mentioned that the recurrent score for the dynamic programming is that if you, know, you want to find the highest score at ZJ and the ZJ could be the one possible is that uh, um, 
the, the score for this uh, single click plus the optimal selection for J minus one, or either uh, the optimal selection for J minus two plus the block, the score for the block, so on and so forth. And you can choose the maximum one for the optimal score for here. And after the time programming and trace back, you can get the optimal selection, just the toy example showing that uh, there's three uh, blocks here and there's something like lower than mu delta. And we have two more tests to do. First one is to define the target region. And we use a heuristic approach to get this target region based on the boundary point. And also we assess the significance of the copy number by permutation test. And I'm, I would then describe it because it's 10. So um, uh, if you, you are interested, you can go to the paper to see more detail. So let's uh, apply the results. We have two sets of simulation and result and TCGA cancer data sets. And in the simulation results, uh, we apply, the first simulation is that uh, there we implant uh, the amplification and deletion on the genome. And then we introduce some noise, the intensity noise and the special noise and report the precision and recall. You can see the picture here, RAG is actually outperformed than other approach. And if you see the sensitivity versus specificity, uh, our approach can achieve the highest sensitivity and also retain some balance of the specificity. And the second simulation is that we want to check whether our approach can recover the, um, um, the event that nested within the high scoring peak. So you can see that we follow the same simulation approach in GSTIC2 and we take all the sampling all the uh, uh, copy number operation from the Penkin data sets. And we have the parameter here is that you can control uh, how many percent of share interval between them. So if it is 100%, that means they are completely dependent. If they are 0%, means they are completely independent. So you can see from 100% to 0%, uh, in the beginning, two approach perform very similar, but uh, after 50%, uh, we can recover more uh, than GSTIC2 does. Uh, so let's talk about result in TCGA cancer data sets. So first of all, we, we, we plot the Venn diagram here to show in the number of predicted events. And you can see that uh, the number here, the red one means amplification, deletion means uh, uh, showing you as a blue. And you can see that the commons in, in all, all methods, the, the overlap between all, all predict by all methods is quite fairly small. And if you check the survey paper here, they also apply, I think it's because the behavior is quite different. And if you actually check the paper here, they apply five methods on two or three cancer data sets. They have the same trend. This, since the approach, they all have different um, behavior. And so we turn the Venn diagram as the fraction of predict nucleotide. And you can see the common uh, section, it's on, only about 0.22%, it's very small, it's very small. And, um, but however, inside this small region, you can get so many important cancer genes and report in uh, uh, the previous study. And in our very small, uh, unique region, uh, we got the RSU1 and RONIS1, we will, we will, take a, we will uh, report that later. And also, if you see uh, the unique region, GSTIC2 and Gaia, they, pre they, pro they provide some a large region wider region. So we plot this histogram to showing that indeed our method predict a very small region and their, the two approach, their behavior is like they, have, they will report some larger region here. And since there's no gold standard, so um, we compare uh, our approach with the non-cancer gene, the census gene from Sanger Cosmic uh, Database and I think the most interesting part is the red column here. You can see this is the percentage of the total prediction overlap with the census gene. And you can see our approach can achieve like one over third our prediction region are covered by the census gene, which is pretty high in GBM. And it's 50% in a break high, it's quite high. And here's an example showing that um, the prediction between REC and GSTIC2, and this is a very good gene and uh, the red, the red can uh, total, not totally, like over, o almost 99% of coverage for this gene. And then showing you uh, some uh, result on a rare event in GBM, this is the unique prediction of REC. And this is a very ra rare event that 
captured by, by the rag, and this uh, RSU is actually a REST suppressor gene, and, and only mutated in fewer than 2% of total sample in GBM. So it's a very rare event we can capture that. And um, another example is the Ronix-1 deletion, which is also a rare event because it mutated in fewer than 10% of breast cancer samples. And you can show in this genome browser here, here means the uh, uh, interval that provides you the boundary endpoint score. And this is a deletion, and if we check because we don't know the deletion is actually the real uh, event or not, so we check the pain cancer analysis. We pull out the 3,000 sample from TCGA and plot the breast cancer here is the dark blue one here, and you can see this is the single nucleotide mutation, and you can see there is a black band inside the rectangle here, means that they are in activation, in activating a single nucleotide variation, and this is kind of consistent to tell that the Ronix one, the loss of function of Ronix one can result in the breast cancer. So in conclusion, we de developed this uh, algorithm and which overcomes some limitation in the current approach. And in simulation, we uh, not only achieve high sensitivity, we also retain some specificity. And we can actually check, uh, get some independent and rare event for the further analysis. You can take our results and combine with other approach to get, to, to check whether the rare events driver or not. And software is available. So I want to thank uh, our lab, my advisor, Ben Raphael, and also the course, Iman. And also to thank the uh, funding source, and also um, the uh, ISMB provide the uh, travel award for me to come in here, thanks. Um, yeah, so, oh, so the question is that um, uh, the recurrence probably the, uh, it's the common, just the common operation uh, or common event in the genome. It's probably not the driver. So I think that um, that's why they uh, most approach per, uh, propose the significance test that permute the data and to make sure in random data you will not find uh, the same the same recurrence score there. So make sure this is probably a significant recurrence region. Yeah.